Tim Hirschbommer. I'm the executive director for the Sports Video Group, which is an uh, industry trade association. Uh, we have a U.S. version called Sports Video Group. We have a European version called SVG Europe. We do not currently have an Asian version called SVG Asia, but maybe someday. Um, thanks for joining us this morning. Uh, our next topic is understanding technology for a better content business. Um, and from talking with the panelists for the last week or so, we have three goals. Uh, the first one is to introduce you to the technology and the services offered by our panelists, because we have a good cross representation of the industry. Um, second, to discuss how those technologies and services can help you improve the quality of your sports content. And third, to discuss the overall trends in sports content distribution marketplace and how those will impact your production. Um, also, please ask any questions at any time. Don't worry about it till the end. So if you have a question, just raise your hand and we'll get you uh, a mic. So one thing we're not going to probably focus on too much, maybe we'll use it as an example of, of what to shoot for. We're not going to talk about Olympic style production and World Cup production. EPL production because you know those they know what they're doing they have a really good budget they can spend money that other people can't so we're going to kind of focus on how up and coming leagues and smaller leagues can kind of get to that level um, so I wanted to begin with uh, Dana Dana Dar with Biz RT I uh, believe you have a couple of videos first right uh, sure we can start off with the, I have to say a couple of words um, so the videos I think what can I discuss that in terms of technology is um, a lot of times, uh, how do you deal with big data when you're doing sports production? And at VizRT, we think that you know our goal is to visualize all this data. So in this world where we're getting so much information from different places, is how do you bring out the data and put it on the screen so that it looks good? So I'm just going to show you uh, two uh, clips. One is from NASCAR. So if you can do the second clip. <laughs> And it's, it's just every little detail is why these cars are kind of Including weather, and even when you go out a little bit wind, uh, some, some, something that may help you here. Uh, we kind of put this into effect. That's uh, an wow. actual gauge of the direction. Those aren't the brain scans of Michael Waltrip. <laughs> I don't have that. So, uh, we don't have that technology. <laughs> but I'll tell you what. It, it And I, I told Doug, I said, thanks. You know, the car's running really good for the engine. And I said, it's the wind gods that are going to determine <laughs> Because I'll tell you what, I've come off turn four and felt that huge gust of wind, watched the RPM come down 100 RPM, and, and qualified fourth. There's your, there's your wind gauge for you guys. That's what you <laughs> that's, yeah, that's okay. That's what I need. Once again, I'm down here beside our Ford Fox Virtual Car. Folks, I want to show you the only change that NASCAR made this season, as far as this Speedway car is concerned, has to do here at the back of the race car. And I'm talking about the rear spoiler. A year ago, it was four inches tall. This year, they've gone to four and a half inches. Now, the big thing is, nobody really thought it was going to make a big difference because they thought it was going to stick the cars to the racetrack a little bit better. Well, what has happened, because of this extra half inch, the cars actually stick better, but they create a bigger weight. Folks, we're down here at the Fox Virtual Car, and we want to show you, you can see the way the body is on our car right now. This protects basically the race car, but let's take it away. That's right. We also, we take that body away. We want to show you what actually helps protect the driver. All the roll cage that's around him, the seats. Let's take a look inside this cockpit area, and you get a better idea of really what's going on inside here. You can see the seat area itself it helps keep the driver's head from flopping around inside there in case you get upside down like we saw Parker Cleveland's car. You can also see all the other roll cage, the bars that are aside to help protect him. All of this right here is designed by NASCAR and if a driver gets upside down or even gets hit hard in the driver's side door, you can see the impact foam there right beside him. But all of this right here is to help keep that driver safe inside his cockpit in case of a violent accident like we just witnessed a moment ago. the viewer understand what is actually going on inside the, the car because 
you know, for me watching, yeah, it looks very cool that they're going very fast, but what's the difference between this car and that car, this driver and that driver? Why, when they crash, they don't kill themselves? You know, they just get a little injury. And these are these kind of things that give you examples as to, yeah, this they have all the technology inside and everything. So we're looking at it as how you visualize it to make each sport. Now, for each sport, uh, there are different things that you want to focus on because, yes, for soccer, it's very easy um, for the big tier sports. But especially here in Asia, when we're looking at different sports, so when you're looking at badminton, what are the specific things that are interesting to the viewer? When you're looking at table tennis, what do they want to see? Volleyball. You know, all the sports that are specific to Asia, then we can take the same technology and just do little adaptations. And this way, you can help educate the viewer who's sitting at home, make it more interesting for him, and then give value to your own production in um, what you're doing. Uh, the second is this so video number three, Spider. And this is inside our sports analysis tool. So Libro is our sports analysis tool. <laughs> everything and for the World Cup this integration so that you can actually see the player as he's running tracking and you don't need to find out who it is we automatically know we've integrated with different heat maps again all the statistical data that helps the viewer visualize and understand what's actually happening um, on the field and you can see all the once you put you know you push a player his name all the statistics comes inside and again this, is, this data is out there, right? There's many companies who aggregate the data, who have it on file. Our job is to, how to make it interesting for the viewer. How does the viewer understand what's going on? How does it make the game more interesting? Um, so that's, I think, what we wanted to start about in terms of how technology enhances your, um, your sports production. So this is, you know, statistical data. We're, of course, also when we're talking about big data, we're also talking about social media. So we've integrated with different, you know, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So within the studio, if you are having all these feeds coming in, you can actually show the viewer what's being said about this player, about that player. Um, the commentator, you know, says, send me your questions via Twitter, via Facebook, and then during halftime, I'll answer. Again, it's all about engaging um, the viewer and making your sports production more interesting so that there's value added in terms of the studio show, which is an hour before the game or the sports game show, an hour after the game. How do we make the viewers stay and watch, not just whistle to whistle, but give you two more hours of production that the viewer would stay and watch. So Dana, what's your sense on um you know, obviously these kind of tools are, are great. Some people look at this and say, how, how, well, first of all, what's the impact on staffing? Do they have to have graphic artists that are hired then? Or are these things going to start to becoming a little bit off the shelf and templated? Um, what, what, how do you kind of see the, the, the cost curve on these sort of graphics kind of falling in the future? What's the challenge? Well, the good thing about, you know, our, I mean, for us, is everything comes from one engine. We believe that we know that there's limited space in your, whether it's your OV truck or in your, uh, production studio, and so every additional thing is, is plugged in, right, to get the data, all the integrations that we do, so it's not that we're adding another machine and another machine and another machine, it's one machine which is getting more and more powerful to show all these, and then you have operators who, you know, when we sell our two products, we, we give training, so the Libro, the sports analysis is something that's very, very easy to do, three-day training, and they're off and going, so it's not issue when you have your operator who's doing that. In terms of designing, designing, you know, is a big issue and the better designers you have, the better the product is going to be. So it's good to, when we talk to the different um, sports broadcasters, we tell them it's good to invest in the good in-house designer who will know how to work with the product and then get the maximum out of the product. So we sell the software, 
but your designer needs to know how to use the product. So it does look like that, you know, 3D model of an F car. <coughs> so it looks good. Or whatever it is you want to show with every type of graphic you want to show. In terms of cost, once you have that in-house designer, then he's there, he's working for you. That's, that's what he's doing. So you don't need to add anything for every new support that comes in. You don't need to add something else. You just do a little adapting of what the graphic looks like, and you're good to go. So what do you see as the challenge for uh, the multi-platform graphics creation? Because I know that that's obviously an issue is to do something like this on TV, kind of translate to the small screen, but even scores, score bugs, yeah. um, tickers. Um, again, that's something that we're working on. Uh, we already have a product that's out there. We, we call it our adaptive graphics device. And so, again, you want to cut costs. You don't want to create a, a graphic that's good for TV, and then a graphic that's good for um, a tablet, and then another one that's good for a phone. So what happens is people usually take that one graphic that they made and then they squeeze it to get it cut and squeeze it even more for your phone. And then you can't really read anything. If you have a bottom, you know, if you have a lower third that has information, nobody's going to be able to read on it. So what we've done is we have, um, we call it our adaptive graphics, that you create the graphic once and then our engine recognizes which device it's going to. So it's going to give you one resolution if it's going to the TV screen. It's going to give you a different resolution when it's going to a phone, it's probably going to show a little less information because you can't put everything on there because it looks the same. And so, again, cutting costs. You only have to create it once, and the engine recognizes where it's going, and that's how it knows how to give you the uh, right resolution. And in addition to cutting costs, we're, you know, we're always looking to help the broadcasters get more revenue out of our product. So because it recognizes the different uh, devices, you can use it as a marketing tool. You have um, some kind of um, market research that's saying one segment watches um, more on their iPhone, or a different market segment watches more on their Samsung, on their Android phone. So you can sell sponsorship for iPhone, saying, okay, let's put um, this logo, this branding when we get the graphics out here. A different sponsor can sponsor the show that's going on to your Samsung device. And then you can have increased revenue for that one production you're getting in more sponsors that don't really compete with each other because each one is going to the right segment that you want to showcase your product to. So we, we're always trying to think how to help the broadcaster not only cut costs, but how to bring in more sponsors to help them create a better product. Is this type of technology only possible from fixed camera positions, or can you utilize it on moving camera? Thinking the of cycling, for example. The sports analysis that we yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. So um, that's actually, uh, it's, um, it's not fixed cameras. What we do is it's, um, it's image based. So we're getting speed. Uh, we're not, we, we do have technology that's based on tracking devices that are on the camera. But we also, the, the VPro is actually, um, it's all algorithms. So you're, you're getting the program feed or you're connected to the EVS that has all the different um, angles. And then you can create new angles, so you're, what we call it 3D flight. You can either move from one camera to the other doing 3D, you get a full 360, and you can even add more cameras. I think in this example there was also a bird's eye view. There's no physical camera there. It's something that's been calculated into um, the program. So with something like cycling, we can do it, either tracking or the image base. It's just different types of tracking. Thank you. Um, we'll get back to you later. Sure. Uh, I want to talk to Terrence at Tata. Now, one of the things that I, I will reference the Olympics because uh, I was there for about two weeks. Um, and one of the things that was definitely a trend at the Olympics and will be at the World Cup as well is the ability to take advantage of, of fiber connectivity offered by yourselves and other companies to really kind of create at home services where much of the production work takes place thousands of miles away in Finland. Uh, the Finns, for example, had an OB truck outside of their broadcast facility in Finland where all the feeds from the Olympics came into and they actually produced the event in Finland and had a much smaller team in Sochi which kept costs down a lot. So I think I'm going to walk through some of the workflows and some of the some of the things you're seeing from your clients. Uh, so do you want to roll the video first? Um, the video? Yeah, hang on. So let me um, introduce myself. Uh, my name is Terence. Um, I'm from Tala Communications. So Tala Communications is the largest owners of uh, submarine fiber networks. So uh, we leverage on our key assets, you know, to bring value to broadcasters. And uh, thank you, Ken, for inviting us, Tata Communications, uh, to the panelists. 
and um, basically we work very closely with Formula One and to later on I will show you some use cases where you know the production can be brought uh, as far as 500 miles or 5,000 miles away from the actual venue. So you know I've stolen some drawings from my solution architect. It looks a little bit more technical, but you know it 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 tells the story. Um, so first things first, I think I will just play the Formula One video and talk about it. As Bernie Ecclestone, Formula One Group CEO, said at the press door, we looked into the market to see who could provide us with the services we needed. And that's why we chose telecommunications. Of all the people we researched, they gave us what we wanted. What we didn't know was if telecommunications could deliver. Only a full Formula One season traveling the world, seamlessly connecting 20 different race locations, as well as bringing Formula1.com to millions worldwide to determine that. So did they deliver? Yes. The services were there race after race. They compressed timescales. They changed the way they were. More importantly, they became an integrated part of our Formula One team. Formula One is a truly global sport, visiting as many as 20 different event locations over the course of the season. It's a huge logistical challenge to ensure that in every one of the circuits we have the same high quality IT connectivity in place. And that's what telecommunications provides for us. It traditionally takes around 30 days to install, test, run, and then dismantle a big MPLS circuit. A lot of planning and effort has gone into condensing that to meet our timescales, with some events just one week apart. Commitment and reliability is one of the key reasons we chose telecommunications as our connectivity provider. Coupled with its global infrastructure, this association means that we can travel anywhere in the world and still expect the same resilience and quality of connectivity. Our website is critical to bringing Formula One to a global audience. The ability for FormulaOne.com content to be delivered quickly and at a high quality is of paramount importance. Consistently high quality global access is the key to giving us the maximum possible freedom to upgrade and introduce new features without compromise. Telecommunications is there to provide us with a CDN solution for FormulaOne.com that helps us to offer the best experience to our users wherever they are. We're looking forward to being able to build on a strong platform and relationship, giving us the freedom and confidence to update and deploy upgrades with features when we want and how we want them without technical limitations. Um, so Formula One doesn't really, you know, uh, appreciate us telling too much about what goes on behind the scenes. <laughs> so we managed to convince Eddie, who is the CTO, to say what he's a, what I'm supposed to say, and you know, we got someone to pitch for us. <laughs> so basically, for Formula One, um, um, you know, the race has been going for many, many years, right? Thirty years, forty years. It has been a long time. But uh, several years ago, when we spoke to Formula One, uh, FOM. Um, they said that, hey, look, you know, we are uh, in going into a new phase where, you know, viewers want to, you know, watch the Formula One races online, uh, new media screens, they want data, they want a lot more things. So, we talk about it, we're talking about, you know, we explore running some of these services on satellite and so on, but it's a very expensive me uh, method, you know, you pay a lot of money. So, we sat down, we did the planning, and we, we thought, hey, let's go on, you know, to run all these services on fiber. And at that time, fiber was really expensive. And usually it takes 30 to 50 days to put on a fiber. So we sat down and we were not sure. And Eddie said that he wasn't sure as well in a video. And we did that. So now we shorten it to 30 days. I mean, from 30 days to three days. So what it means for rights holders, what it means for production houses is that we can now turn around a lot of these services uh, in a shorter time. Uh, previously, you need to hire s and people. Uh, OU, OU, OU uh, truck to put the uplinks. Now we can, we can, all we need to do is put, put in a pipe. If you remember in the video, they have the boxes, right, with some yellow cabling and so on. That is all we need to, you know, pull the video from the camera feed. And that goes all the way back uh, in, in London. So we do a lot of data. We pull in a lot of data from, from the racetracks, like uh, the cornering, the speed, and so on. And that goes into uh, a London the headquarters for processing and then to bring that 
or new media. That's where you see the lab times and so on. So, so that's our partnership with um, FOM. And I think back to your question, Ken, on regarding offsite production. Um, uh, I was mentioning earlier on that I've stolen some diagrams. Uh, perhaps I can illustrate better with the diagrams. Can I have the slide one, please? Okay, sorry about technicalities. All I did was I just stole from uh, the proposal from my solution engineer and I thought it's useful. <laughs> so if you see on the left side, it says a race site. So this is a motor racing example. It can be a two-way motor racing, it can be anything, right? So you have uh, multiple locations and um, most of the broadcast feeds are already on satellite. In many cases, the work is on satellite, right? But if you want to get more full through revenue from new media, right, you need to have something unique. Perhaps a reporter walking around with an RF camera, or maybe you know you want to pick up a camera on top of you know the judge or the referee's helmet or something. So what we did was we took RF means uh, you know wireless camera. So we took the RF camera. Uh, they had a reporter on site walking around, reporting the crashes, reporting the teams getting ready for the race. That gets pushed into the box. And you see there's, there's one line, only one line um, over there that says one times 20 meg or something, a HD feed. So because it's for new media, the new, new media department has got limited budget. So if it's a broadcast, uh, we need to put in two fibers, one plus one, to make sure that you know if one breaks, the, the show still continues. But in this case, they say, hey, we are happy with if, the, if something happens, if it breaks, it breaks. You know, we still have the world to play around with the production. So that feed, uh, we pick it up from the camera, going all the way to their production studio in a different country. So we, we have a global media network, which is one plus one, which is that means it's fully re, you know resilient. That doesn't matter, you know, it, it gets pushed all the way to uh, the production studio in, in, in a remote country far, far away, where 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 the producers are all you know and their team are all sitting and are looking through the multiple screens. So I think that. That explains um, your question earlier on, on, on uh, production uh, from a certain location. Oh, one thing I've also seen over the, this is definitely a trend over the last two to three years, is uh, once upon a time they would have to first book their backhaul circuit, <coughs> then there were the phones, you had your phone circuits, then you had your internet data, and the last two years or so people now are just taking the one fiber and riding everything over. What, is the, what are some of the cost savings? Um, and how does that change the discussions you have when they say we want to have not only the video and the audio signals but also the VoIP and our internet because you know they feel that that cuts down on them having to deal with 15 different. Yeah. So so without going too deeply into technology, basically for fiber we can carry voice, video, data, and multiple service on one big fat pipe. So instead of traditionally where you need to procure five different services and manage five vendors, all we need now is one big fat pipe and running multiple service, services on that pipe. So just be it because uh, the cost of fiber has dropped tremendously over the last several years. Yeah. I think uh, at the Olympics, I think France Television saved like $50,000 just by moving yeah. their internet, because it was a different, it required a whole different circuit and a whole different um, you know, pop and that. In, in, in some instances, we have customers <coughs> told us that they saved 40% compared to before they implemented fiber. So, it's really case by case, and uh, we are not here to replace satellite. We are here to look at the situation and see how we could complement satellite, and whether we can replace some of the traditional services that are too painful to manage. So that all we need is a clean fat, take time from point A to point B, and get all the work done in a remote location. And not mentioning we save a lot on traveling expenses for production crew, hotel, taxis, and so on, and manpower as well. So uh, Wolfgang wanted to have the... Uh, Just have one more, sorry. <laughs> I have one more slide there, which yeah, is for <laughs> cricket. <laughs> so, so, so this is... Um, I thought cricket is um, uh, interesting. So um, there's also another trend uh, um, that's emerging. Like uh, we had clients uh, talking to us regarding, you know, replacing uh, OU trucks or satellite services. Uh, to the stadium. So we replace that by fiber because fiber is cheap enough now to implement. And you look at the boxes uh, on the left side, left hand side, these are all the stadiums in India. 
So instead of you know booking for occasional use truck, we just push in the fiber and and we do not charge by per hour because if you were to hire those trucks, they charge you exorbitant rates on a daily basis or a per hour basis. For us, once the fiber is on, it remains on till end of the event for a single fixed price. Um, and then once it goes to the Tata Media Port, uh, this is not comprehensive, this is not all the notes, it's just for illustration. So for example, if London wants uh, the cricket matches, we can push it all the way to BD Tower, it's on the top, or you can go to, go to Dubai, or you can go to US, Singapore, Hong Kong, Sydney, wherever. If it needs to go up to the sky, we just you know push it to a tiny port for uplinking. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. So Wolfgang, you know, taking in Dana's presentation, Terence, I mean, from the from the HBS perspective, uh, maybe talk about how you're seeing production workflows and how sort of this changes the way you approach production and cost effectiveness and what have you. Just briefly, as an introduction, um, it's not completely wrong what's on the on the view, but in fact, I'm employed by host broadcast service by HBS, but being a hundred percent affiliate, I'm here as well a little bit to to talk about workflow and production, but as well on, on the agency side of the business. But yeah, talking about the workflow. Um, on, yeah, yeah, sure. okay. <laughs> um, workflow is, of course, I mean, for from the HBS perspective, wearing the one color of uh, my, my job on the podium, um, an event of that high level, uh, for Terence is the Formula One, for us is very much the workflow. Redundancy is obviously a very important thing. So um, we always put in place at a work have a lot of backup fibers. The contribution out of the stadium is in fact similar to what Thomas uh, just explained, going directly from each stadium into the IDC. But there's always a satellite backup. We wouldn't, for World Cup, just rely on one single part. So there's always a backup, always a second. Um, when it comes to smaller events, to lesser events, to events that are of course of value and of importance, we mainly rely on satellites still for the transmission. Reason for that being is so far, I mean, we, we appreciate all the development in putting fiber, laying our fiber, maybe a submarine or maybe um, in any other terrestrial area. But the satellite transmission still has the big advantage that within the given footprint, you reach really every single taker. The fiber connectivity is still not as advanced as we need for our events. So uh, we, we, of course, not only talk to the major broadcaster, but as well to each broadcaster. We deliver as well signals and um, uh, footage material programs to um, online platforms, to betting companies. Not all of them have the proper fiber connectivity. And therefore, for us, satellite remains still absolutely necessary. For, the, well, for example, at the World Cup, the stadiums will be connected via fiber. Back to the IBC, but then going out from the IBC satellite when you're distributing to the world broadcasters. Exactly. Right. There, there is still the fiber backup to teleports, but from there we would have as well rely on, 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 to a certain extent, on satellite transmissions. So, for example, transatlantic fiber goes out of the IBC into Geneva, into Los Angeles, into several other ports. So, we really have a full redundant uh, backup solution. The satellite is, for most of the broadcasters, for most of the world feeds, the, the common reception point. So when you're looking at a, a, a lesser event than the World Cup, what are the, the compromises from a production standpoint that are required in order to keep costs down? It's usually as simple as less cameras and and uh, less EBS servers, or how does it kind of roll through that? No, we're talking on exactly the capturing of, of the signal over there at each event. We don't compromise. You can't say that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I would never say so. Um, for every single event, at the end of the day, once you have somebody who wants to follow, once you have a broadcaster, any other media company that wants to show these, they don't want to see any compromise. They want to see the quality. Okay, the forum here, the podium, is much about the technology, which of course is very important, how you handle what you can show and so on, but at the end of the day, for us, it's the manpower operator that gives the real essential of what you see, uh, essential point of what you see. Um, okay, no human being can out of a, a 25 frame per second camera can make an ultra motion or super slow motion or anything. So we put the gear in place, of course. But how you how you capture it, how you direct it, how you put it on into into a world feed, that's clearly the manpower behind. Lesser event, what would that mean for me? Um, uh, anything to work, I was more or less lesser. <laughs> 
So we were still talking about world championships in um, in ice hockey, for example, world championships in uh, well, the, the, the Ironman, which is of course for the given target group, for the given uh, following, an important event. They may not be so much interested in football. Handball is clearly a sport that is not of interest in, in many countries all of, all of Europe, but in Europe, in Denmark, in Scandinavia, Germany, Austria, France, Spain, being significant markets over there, you can't just tell them we, we sacrifice on anything and we, 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 uh, we, we would reduce the quality. In fact, when you look at the, the level of the gear that is put in place on these things, it has tremendously uh, developed. By the way, driven by the agencies, driven by the agencies who are in touch always with the broadcasters, who uh, get the information, analyze the market, what is required, what is desired. On the other hand, then, source in the market what is technologically driven, and we wouldn't just let the, the, the domestic broadcaster do the production to their liking, but we would always insist that each match, each team is covered the same way, and we would be the ones who uh, tell them in what position to place which camera. Well, how do you this, the decision on the technology. Okay, so it sounds like you take control of the situation, right, rather than simply allow the event to unfold the way it may have naturally. So how do you how do you get control and have the domestic part for our broadcasters buy into your philosophy and 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 not compromise? Because compromising is very easy to do when budgets are important and, and people are trying to keep things as cheap as possible. So how how do you win those arguments to not go as cheap as possible? Com compromising is easy to do, difficult to justify. <laughs> um, but yeah, there, there's a common understanding from my point of view now that an event has a brand, that the sport is important, that you want to continuously recognize what you're watching when you are a fan, when you're a supporter. So therefore, as just to, to create an example, as a Danish broadcaster always wants to rely on a given quality when the signal comes out of Spain, it's the other way around as well. So in that sense, it was a learning effect. It was. It took some time to to, to tell them what. From time to time, we even supplement budgets. From time to time, we do it in full ourselves and uh, implement the whole production over there. Um, but it has been a learning effect, and now the broadcasters they they understand that whatever they want to do, especially, they do it in a separate directing room, a separate a separate control room on the OP truck and one of the same OP truck based on the same signals and undercutting, for example, the feed with close-up signals of their individual players when it comes to handball, for example. Um, but yeah, in fact, we are in control of everything. We oblige the host broadcaster, the domestic broadcaster, to implement our way, our guidelines, our um, production philosophy. Um, we, we define the running order, what is on screen in terms of uh, what players introduce, what graphic is put in what place. Um, uh, of course, there is uh, the spillover of everything that HBS has implemented in the World Cup. That's, by the way, a general statement that I can do. HBS has always been at the forefront of implementing workflows at the cutting edge level, using, of course, the technology that all the, the, my neighbors here are developing. We are not developing technology itself, but we are the ones who put it together in a workflow, who combine it to world feed, who combine it to a product event related services being delivered to broadcasters and coming back to the original question and these learnings, these, these strategies, these approaches to covering an event, um, that is from my point of view something the whole industry in the sports marketing and the event creation and the event organization profits from. The learning effect, it must be standardized, it must be consistent, there should be too much freedom for the, for the standardized aspect of the live production. Um, and we'll get back to you as well. So Maurizio, why don't you, uh, I guess if there's a disruptive person up here, it's, it's the Samsung, right? The, the, the Samsung is disruptive is the kindest thing I've ever been called. So that's, <laughs> that's good. No, you know, the, Sam, the handheld devices, what's going on in that market, is causing a lot of hand wringing, if you will, with the traditional broadcasters understanding what's the impact on, on their, you know, their brand and their relationships with fans. and. Um, I know you have a presentation here on, on the Samsung Media uh, yeah. Center, so. Both in no, the, the Samsung <laughs> uh, Thanks. Uh, uh, yes, just working, I thought you wanted to. <laughs> no, that's good. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, thank you very much for, uh, for uh, having 
us here. And, uh, and it's true, I work for a company that has been disruptive for, uh, for the past four or five years. I work in a division called Media Solutions Center and our goal is to find ways uh, around content and services to create loyalty for uh, our brand. Meaning, uh, why should you buy a Samsung device or why should you stay with a Samsung device? We know that uh, if you have an iPhone, uh, you are kind of forced uh, to stay with that, otherwise you lose all your YouTube, iTunes and movies that you have downloaded. But if you are on an Android platform, you can switch from Samsung, HTC, Sony, maybe to come back. So the idea is how do we foster this relationship with our users? So sports is being proven to be a good, um, a good way to drive adoption of technology. Sports fans are extremely loyal. And uh, the idea is uh, why not try to build a service around sports? So out of Singapore, we have created a product called uh, SportsFlow. It's basically an, uh, an application that aggregates content coming from multiple sources. It's customizable. You can choose and pick uh, whatever kind of sports you want, and you can find uh, the sources that you're looking for. It's available across three devices, actually. The Smart TV version will be released uh, mid-April this year. And uh, you know we are we 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 have a, a quite uh, wide uh, coverage coming from different partners: ESPN, FC, BBC, Yahoo, um, third parties, third party websites that are looking for a bigger distribution in uh, in Southeast Asia. Of course, there's social integration, and that's I think the most interesting part. I mean, when 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 you when you watch something on TV, right now you are either Tweeting, tweeting your Facebook page, sometimes you, you keep on texting or you are WhatsApping. But uh, it is definitely something that is more social even if you are not at the stadium anymore. Right? You, you, you can stay in touch with your uh, fellow friends, fellow team supporters. So the idea is uh, I, I'm, we are basically at the, at the end of all this uh, production flow. Yeah, we have Awesome graphics, awesome production places, huge pipes that can handle transmission of data. But the idea is how how can we package everything and make it available to our users? So this could be a, an, an entry point for uh, sports fans in the region to have access to something that is either not available on uh, regular broadcasting or uh, maybe even exclusive to our uh, to our users. Uh, we just launched, for instance, uh, a live service in New Zealand where we are uh, the exclusive, exclusive distributors of EPL games. So um, this is a way for us to reach out to this community of uh, English Premier League fans and say, hey, if you want these games, why not watching this on these awesome devices? So how do you get those, or what, what are your relationships with sports leagues and federations and what, how do you strike the deals with them for content? Um, I mean, are you just are you just a bidder, just like any other rights holder? Um, we're not there yet. Uh, I think that uh, it's more about uh, making sure that people know that they can use our platform uh, to reach out to a wider audience. Right now, we are uh, happy, com content in uh, you know talking to these leads that uh, have these kind of needs. They do want. Uh, to have uh, this relationship uh, with an audience, maybe bypassing the regular broadcasters, not because they don't want to be there, but simply because sometimes they don't have the resources. There's not enough time. I mean, you have 24 hours, X amount of channels, oops. If you have taken 10 of them, and all of a sudden, handball, if they want to get some distribution here in Asia, they might have to be creative. It's, it's, it's nothing wrong, it's, it's just the way the business is structured, right? Mm -hmm. So we are making uh, something available mm -hmm. to them uh, and they can run uh, with it the way they see fit. They want to make it available on a thing basis, they want to make it available ad-supported, they want to, to carry the <coughs> sponsors on our platforms. They have talked about uh, how easy, it is easy for them to differentiate the different, uh, the different offering according to the device. Um, I don't know if in the future we will be interested or able uh, to go into this 
pure content acquisition process. There are other things that will come into play. Let's say that uh, we acquire some rights or we go for some rights. Maybe these rights owners will, maybe this deal might prevent them to go after some sponsors that operate in our own uh, field of technology, so it might not work out. So we are, we are more as, um, uh, Sportsway is more of a platform for the publishers to find a new a new audience, for the audience to, to find more content that we curate, uh, and for brands uh, to engage these audience. As long as we stay true to these uh, three parameters, let's put it this way, this should be enough for us. So um, <clears throat> before we get into the conversation on, you know, on just sort of the uh, how people can apply your technologies in a more cost-effective way, I guess just to follow up real quick on this, from your perspective, Samsung, okay, when I talk to people who are our age, if you will, who work at TV networks, they're all concerned. They don't understand what the future is. They think no one's going to want to watch TV. They talk, every time they mention someone who's 17 or 15 years old, they say they don't watch TV. They're never going to watch TV. Now, you make big TVs, right, and ultra HD sets, and you also make the small phones. Are you, as a company, concerned about that, or do you think that... How do you envision the, the sports consuming ex experience evolving over the next few years? Well, I cannot speculate about uh, you know corporate uh, corporate strategy on this. I I think that uh, whatever the age is, though, if it's something live, it's a big event. Uh, whether it's the, the, the FIFA World Cup, whether it's uh, Grand Prix, the, 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 the Olympics, whether winter or, or summer. I think that we are going to naturally gravitate uh, to big screens. Now, whether these big screens are in our homes or, in, or they are somewhere else, sports bars, sports venues, that doesn't matter, right? Uh, I mean, when, uh, when South Korea played Japan in 2008 for, or 2009 in the, in the final of the World Base, Baseball World Classic, uh, there were 65,000 people at the Olympic Stadium watching that event, not at home, despite the fact that it was being broadcast, uh, but they were watching it live uh, in Seoul, right, in the stadium. Um, I think that uh, if it is live, it, it is important, uh, and these guys are, are doing an awesome job, uh, we are going to, to find the biggest screen available and watch it there. Now, if I'm working, if I'm traveling, if I cannot find, if this is the biggest screen available, this will be my choice. If it is something instead a little bit of more of a niche, extreme sports, sports documentaries, sports magazines, I think that it's going to be, it, it's just the way how we consume content. I'm not going to watch this on a big screen because maybe I don't have a big screen. Maybe I just have my iPad, maybe I just have my Samsung Note, maybe I have uh, a, a Microsoft Surface, I will find something over there. So, so then it's, when you talk about those kind of productions, those extreme sports, those, those are the smaller productions I guess we should probably talk about, right? So, because again, the EPLs, the World Cups, you guys have distribution that's pretty good. Um, I think the real interesting challenge now is how some of these niche sports have a big time look where they may not have the budget because they may be distributed over the internet where there's a small audience. So from your perspective, I mean, Dan, when you talk to people about the look that they want, um, how do you manage their expectations? How do you, and, and uh, but uh, will their expectations be meant, met, met over time because gradually the cost curves continue to descend a little bit? Um, um, I think, and just going back to something Wolfgang says, for the people watching that specific event, that's the big event. I mean, for someone who's interested in extreme sports, uh, who's sitting at home, he doesn't care how much the rights went for, right? Yeah. How much they paid, where they paid it, uh, Premier League prices, or if they paid um, a small percentage of that. For them, they want to sit at home and consume the best events they can in the extreme sports or in these niche sports, as we like to call them. So I think it's our responsibility to give the viewer a good viewing experience, even if it, even if the broadcaster didn't pay the same amount of money for the rights. Um, and it is um, the Premier League rights or other tier one sports, and then they buy to supplement their, you know, they have to put in more things. So they buy the tier two, the tier three. However, they've also bought our graphic engine to make the tier one look good. So they can use the same system to make the tier two and the tier three look good. And, and that's what they need to look at, you know, the bigger picture. 
So yes, you paid several hundred dollars, uh, several hundred million dollars for um, for the tier one rights. Then of course, you know, the added cost of the graphics that you add to it or anything else to make it is small. However, if you pay a small percentage of that, you're not going to want to pay the same amount of money. So our challenge is to see how we can make um, the graphics look as good within different budgets. And that's why we, you know, we approach the broadcasters in, in different ways, and we find that it is possible to, you know, in India we just did um, a, a hockey league. So, you know, Star Sports decided to do their own, I mean, there was a hockey league. And so we managed to find a way, and then it's, an, it's important to understand what the sport is, what the story behind the sport is, and then how do you visualize that specific thing to make the sport more interesting. If it's extreme sports, you know, you want to put, it's more of a, where do you put the cameras, right? In the right angle. So do you use the GoPro cameras? Do you use the traditional cameras to make the sport more exciting? Um, in hockey, it's how do you build a story behind these things? It's a new league, it's new people. Let's make the, the heroes of the game. Because it's all about the storytelling. And so we look, how do you, what's the story here? And how do we make the story stand out? And we use graphics to do that. So if you want to talk about, you know, the immersive graphics, how do you fit that into the game? If you want to add some, um, you know, tracking, how do you do this? I mean, hockey, they're very interested in the speed of the ball. How fast is it going? So I think each sport, on the one hand, we're looking at it in the same perspective in terms of uh, we all want to have a good viewing experience. But then we need to look at each sport and say, how does our technology work best to make this specific sport look the best it can look? And it's a challenge for each sport to understand what the story is and how to display it in the best way possible. Do you think that the federations have to kind of step in there a little bit and take control? Because once they lose the rights, then, then also they lose that control. And I think that's one of the big problems I've heard, that they, they look for the most of the rights, and then when they sell the person who got for, the, for the biggest check yeah. of the rights, that person in turn hires the company for the least amount of money to do the production. So should the federation step in here, and how can they? I think so. I mean, I think it's, it's helpful. I mean, we try, to, we try to involve them. We try to talk to them so that when they do sell the rights, it's um, to get an understanding that it's not only who you sell the rights to, but who's going to be producing the games afterwards? You know, who's the production company that's going to be doing it? Mm -hmm. that's exactly, that's what I wanted to say. Uh, <coughs> complementing your statement, it's always you need a certain threshold of income, a certain, certain budget to abide by these sophisticated solutions as visit are doing it. The analytic tools are a perfect uh, possibility to explain for certain moves, certain testing tactics, certain. Um, uh, situations of the game, why it happened this way, why this was the outcome, why they came to score, why they scored, why they marked it or not, nothing like that. It still remains something you need to explain. So you need somebody who's there with the, with the brain work of the sport, who is capable of analyzing it. This is the visual, uh, visualization. So HBS um, did a job particularly in using the you team now for the coming World Cup in um, putting it onto the mice and natural feed, which is a challenge. You always have one person explaining it in the language of the of the target broadcaster um, with the focus that possibly this country may have. And we try to implement that on a multilateral basis, not only on a unilateral basis. So we act on behalf of FIFA and bring their tools into the so-called EDIF, the Extended Broadcast International Feed, which has normally not only the live match, but that's the uh, Dana talked before, it has an hour before and an hour afterwards with some half-time analytics as well. So it's us implementing it in there, and you said it rightly, it's basically on behalf of FIFA. So FIFA as a federation said, we want this, we want to explain the sport, we want to enrich the content, and therefore it's them to step in. And this is uh, as well something where, where, where HBS can, can uh, give a certain extra value. If each individual broadcaster has to pay this, of course, for them it may be too expensive. If each individual uh, media company, internet company, has to do this, they have to have an editorial team, they have to have an announcer, they have to have somebody operate. If this goes into the world feed, of course there's still some adaption being done, as I said, language explanation, scripting, and so on. But on the other hand, it facilitates the possibility of making use of it at all. And I think for you it's two-sided. Yeah. On the one hand, we may take away the business on this World Cup because World Cup is exactly as I said, they pay already quite a lot of money for the for the rights and they 
have in theory, the broadcasters have in theory the budget to spend on it, but on the other hand, it can facilitate very well that Blizzard, for example, goes into new sports, smaller sports, lesser sports, and has a good market in that. So one of the things that's also uh, definitely on, on at the Olympics, and I've seen it in the United States at some big events, um, and I'll, I'll use an American football, as in the NFL example. <coughs> CBS, two year, only two years ago, CBS would come to me and, and we would talk about stories on, on how they're producing the NFC championship game. And they would say, you know, we're moving our studio. We used to go, to, so we used to bring the studio show on the road for those big games, but then we have to have the studio show that has means the sets there, and we also have to have a production truck there because that production has to be done separate from the game production because you can't have, you know, when you switch from the pregame show to the game, there's a two second turnoff. You can't have people swapping in and out of seats in the trucks. So they said, we, we're done with that. We're just going to have our studio shows done in New York City because that's where the control room is. But now, what's happened, and they started this past season. <coughs> They're able to go back with the studio shows being on the road because the controls are all done from the control room in New York City. So all those those five or six camera signals come back to New York and they switch it there. And for the Olympics, time and time again, people were able to put studios out. So there, there were less studios in the IBC and more out and around the different venues because they were just taking those camera signals and controlling them from either the IBC or back home. So. You know, how is that changing the storytelling? I know we talked about that a little bit yesterday. There's so much emphasis on the game, especially for smaller leagues. They forget about, and the smaller broadcasts, they forget about the opportunity to build a pre-game and a post-game and drive more revenue that way. So can you talk about maybe those cost savings and how that might open up that opportunity to approach shows that way? Um, well, I think um, in terms of you know, doing things remotely, uh, I think you can actually if you think it's cost saving and it also has additional um, <coughs> control value because we, one of our applications is that if you're uh, doing a production of a game, you have access, let's say there's 12 cameras on the field, um, you have the EBS back in the studio, you have access to all 12 cameras. But during the game, um, I don't know, there was something, something happened, there was an event, and the viewer at home only saw three different angles because that's what the director wanted to put. For the post game, the director has the ability, since he saw the event from camera five, which was not on air during the live game, but he has the option to choose, okay, I'm gonna now show camera five and camera six, which weren't shown. And then you were giving the viewer an additional value. So he said, I did see this in the game, but oh look, this is so cool, I'm seeing it from a different angle, I didn't notice that this player came from there. So you're giving more value, and then it's easier to do when you're doing it remote. And this is like a whole different production. You're not only using the program fee that you already received and that the whole world received, you're saying I can give more value to what I have by operating remotely from, um, because I have access to all the cameras that are in the stadium and you're never gonna see all angles during the actual game. So we actually have a product I think, coming out in the end of the month that, that does that, that gives the producer in the studio access to all the cameras irrelevant of what's being shown from the production truck. The relevant of the equipment that's put in place. It's connected to the EBS, and so he has access to all the cameras that are showing, and then he can just choose which angles he wants to show. He can do his analysis in the meantime, and then show it in our post game, uh, or just show even you know a part of the highlights, giving you a different view. So again, extending the story, showing something else than was shown during the game itself. Well, as far as that the alternate angle look, I mean, the devices, that's the whole second screen experience, too. I mean, how do you how do you all see the second screen where there's the potential for the person to be watching on the big screen and then on a second device watching alternate angles and alternate content? I mean, do you see that becoming more of a reality, or do people just want sort of one experience with the best available screen? I think that is very personal. I mean, these are our personal devices, right? So what do you do? Why you are watching something, whether it's a movie, whether it's a sport event in this case, it's um, it's very personal. I mean, in in the United States, there's already a second screen experience basically for everything that is on TV. It's called Twitter, and everybody's using it. Yeah. So it's it's difficult to crack this problem and solve this problem. Right? When it comes to sports, though, there are so many so many stories that can be told. Uh, that I think that these devices can indeed, uh, whether it's uh, it's whether they are the small screens or the big screens, even a, even a, even the smart TV now you can you can split up the screen in an hour and a half TV sets. 
you can uh, split up the screen on four parts. Uh, if you have four uh, different feeds, uh, you can see four different things. But again, uh, it comes down to to HBS whether they make this four screen for the four feeds available yeah. to the end user. I mean, F1 in their standard package uh, for the broadcasters, they do provide uh, you know multi multi angle camera. The, you, you follow your own uh, favorite driver. Uh, so this kind of approach is already there. I think that for us. Uh, it's, it's a combination of that uh, when it's available. Uh, I don't see smaller federations or smaller events going uh, that way. Maybe though they will be able to piggyback on the existing social media tool uh, to create something that is complementary to the existing TV feed, uh, something that can be used uh, as something that you can interact uh, with your uh, with your fellow fans, or even with the studio, with the, with the commentators, and, and, and I think I agree with you because um, if you integrate social media, you know the, the production uh, in, in the studio, right? You can also take a look at what are the um, the feedback from the social media, yes. and you see a lot of high ball hit on 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 that special sc special screen or the special angle, then the people in the studio would know that hey, look, let's let's give more value by showing that angle. So you can make decision based on that. Yes. And there's a lot of pull through revenue, like um, maybe I'm on Facebook or I'm, I'm on some social media platform. Uh, when I when I see my friends commenting on it, I may just click on the link and go to a web page, microsite that say, pay 15 bucks if you want to you know, watch this race well, or this game, and then I may end up paying for it. So, so there'll be pull through revenue from, from a social perspective. So Yeah, if I, if I may add to that, actually, I see, this is something that uh, uh, th this kind of interaction with the actual live event uh, is happening more and more. I mean, uh, the, you, it, it's it's just part of our nature of life. Whether we use Twitter, whether we use Facebook, it, it doesn't matter. We want to comment on what is happening. Was penalty no penalty? Referee is a crow. No, it's so fair. It's just part of our uh, sports fans conversation, right? So the idea is. Uh, how do we integrate everything? It cannot be disjoint from what they are showing, from what they are showing on yeah. uh, on, on, uh, on screen graphic. I think that one 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 thing that is interesting is maybe to see whether there's the room to actually monetize these separate feeds. Is there a room to have something that is specific for Chelsea? Is there room something that specific to monetize something that is specific for a bicycle rider or an F1 rider. I don't know, we, we, it might happen. It's a, a think about the last... Can I step in? Sure, please. Uh, I'm changing the shirt again to the <laughs> agency. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's actually quite quite two-sided as well. On the one hand, you it's, it's a tremendous opportunity how you can get the fan engaged um, by these second screen device. Um, you mentioned eyeballs, uh, beautiful, you can interact and so on. Of course, there's a certain uh, attachment, a certain affiliation to that event, to that sport, to that club, whoever offers that opportunity. On the other hand, you, you talk about eyeballs. I don't want eyeballs anymore. I want somebody who is there and who's following the match because over there in each event there's advertising. Around. So it changes. And if, if uh, uh, yeah, I forgot that point. If there's anybody who just follows too many screens, who's distracted by data here, social media, their feed coming in there, oh damn, I missed that virtual insertion of a beautiful animated uh, sponsored graphics or something like that. What's the value of that sponsorship? So you've got to really look at it, how you do this and how you don't dispel your sponsors. So the, the beauty of it is really engaging it and offering the sponsors the two-sided thing. So getting the fans involved in it and changing eyeballs into communication, changing eyeballs into engagement, interaction, and so on. Eyeballs themselves don't count anymore, that's true, but the opportunity of, of monetizing these things are most probably as they're selling it to the same sponsor of the event, but giving them different choices and ensuring that they reach everybody still. I think um, this is my personal opinion that perhaps there are major you know, uh, world events that have got much uh, bigger sponsorship package coming in, and then that one I, I agree with you that then you should put it on the big screen. But there are 
they are smaller leagues and smaller games that you know fight very hard for more sponsorship and if they are not getting enough sponsors for the main screen then they may have to find alternative revenue so, so that's my personal opinion um, we have uh, customers uh, who organize boxing matches the, the smaller scale ones that do not get a lot of attention uh, from sponsors and what they do is they engage us for uh, online streaming straight to the CDN, very little production. And what they did was that besides the usual cameras, they have the GoPro camera mounted on, on the rest. And they are and the 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 trend is that you know the, the online media folks watching on the second screen, of all the of all the camera feeds they can choose, they chose the one on the referee's the headgear. And they're willing to pay a lot of money for that. So so obviously I'm not expert in production as you can see uh, I'm, 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 I'm doing fire for delivery, but I'm speaking from... Stealing charts. <laughs> charts from my, the same company, so it's all right. So, so that's my personal opinion as, as, as a viewer, someone who holds a huge galaxy note in my pocket, you know, so... so mm. I, I, it's I, not I, that big, come on. <laughs> I'm surviving, you know, it's, it's good. So um, that's my personal opinion, and, and that's feedback from my customers, um, uh, because not all, not all right holders, not all organizers have got multi million dollar budget so uh, this if if i may add to 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 your comments here i think that the sports is extremely personal i think that the, we had show and uh, top five moments mm -hmm. in our lives uh, probably one is a sport event you know wedding divorce mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, 2006, Italy winning the World Cup, and then 1982, <laughs> winning the World Cup, of course. But, but the thing is, uh, it, it, it's, it's a good point, the one that you made, because a sports is extremely personal. So if you make something updatable that gives you the idea that uh, you are closer to the action, it's very likely that you are going to choose. Now, we are talking about GoPro cameras, but why not talking about Google Glass? I mean. What about having checked during two years, uh, two years ago, during the, the shootout, penalty shootout of uh, Champions League? I mean, wouldn't have you paid to, to watch his point of view during the last uh, penalty? Mm. How much? You said yes, so how much? 20 bucks maybe for those two, two seconds? Not even live, maybe just on, just on demand, right? Uh, so if you go, if you go down to, 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 to the power of properly monetizing all these bits of information that we are, all these stories actually, that we are able to build around the sport event. Uh, I think that we are living in very interesting times. We are living in, a, in, a, in an era where uh, it's true that if I blink and I miss uh, my competitor's logo at a mid-court, uh, but that doesn't mean that that logo will not appear somewhere else on another device. But, but I understand the good point, and I support him uh, when he said, "Be careful. We wouldn't want too many eyeballs looking away because there but is that, the big money." Are, but the, are they looking away, or are they looking at the same away away from now we are away from the sponsorship down. logo? They are still watching the same sports, the same games. But I think what he was referring to is the sponsors pay big money. You gotta make sure that. You know, you, you return value to the sponsors by forcing them to look at <laughs> their logo rather than looking away and then forgetting about it. Maybe that's what your, your point was. And if, if, I, if I understand him well, I think from that perspective, I, I agree. Yeah. But Dana's point earlier about the, um, the, the overhead shot in that graphic, how there was no camera in that overhead position. Um, the Yankees in New York, in New York they, they have this new camera system that uh, it uses fixed cameras and, and they're put around the stadium um, and they say they were showing me some of the things they're able to do and to your point they can virtually once they have those cameras and they stitch all those camera signals together from those different positions they can virtually go anywhere within that field of view and create a virtual look so for example you can be the ball you could literally be the ball and follow the ball into the net or be the follow the ball in the pitcher's hand and as the Pitch releases it, you can follow the ball in over the plate. So we're like we're at an interesting time where that's you know, and, and it's, it's, comp it's products like the Biz, and, and obviously there's real time uh, rendering process is a big challenge there. Yeah. But um, you know, the first virtual lines were all of, uh, and a massive truck 
Yes, it's yeah. the truck that's the yeah. servers and that was I think it is uh, the fifth year anniversary of uh, the yellow line of the first time. So then um, I guess well that last question as far as the, the Asian marketplace in general. I mean how I know there is I guess Korea and Japan are sort of in their own thing as far as ultra H D and what have you. So how is the rest of the market developing as far as um, budgets and and I know everyone's talking EPL, EPL, but you know we're not in England. I mean, how how can the how can the Asian sports kind of rise out and, and really build a brand around the, around the globe? Should I start? Please. <laughs> um, my perspective is that again, it's um, you know EPL has done tremendous marketing out here, which is why everyone is a fan, and I think a lot of the other European uh, federations should understand the timing issues and also move their game so that you know to build a wider fan base here. Um, but after the APL, um, if you look at different surveys, when you go to the different countries here in Asia, you can see that in Indonesia, um, the Indonesian badminton has higher viewership than the EPL. Or in Thailand, women's volleyball has about the same viewership and rating as EPL. So if you were looking at a global brand, yes, EPL is number one. But if we're looking at individual countries and what they're looking at, so each country has its own sport. Like if you go to the US, you will say, okay, NFL is number one in terms of ratings. It's not that popular here, but each country has its own sports that it's like, you know, Korea, Japan, baseball, Taiwan also loves baseball. So the challenge is, again, to look at, I think in essence, as viewers, we're, we're very similar. So if you are excited about you know, the World Cup, Italy World Cup, but someone here in, um, in China can be excited about, you know, their number one uh, table tennis player winning the World Championship, and to them it's an, as big as an event as Italy in the World Cup. So we're all, we all get excited from the same things. We all want to see um, the programs looking good. And the challenge is to look and see, you know, it, it is a diverse place, it's a continent. And so to go to each country and say, okay, what is your number one, two, three, four sport? put EPL aside, and then go, let's work on that. And, and let's see how we can maximize these things and make these look, look the best they can look. And so that then the viewership will increase. Because it doesn't help, I mean, you know, for us, we work with TV. So if I go to an event and I see a 10,000 stadium packed with fans that are crazy and shouting, I know that somebody at home wants to have this experience. So how do we bring them that experience? Exactly one point that you, that you raised right now, again, agency <laughs> um, Each sport needs to know exactly the fan, needs to know exactly the following, who is the need to address. Production technology or the development my, my, my uh, fellow uh, members on the podium here developed, they, they could potentially help to develop that one, but you've got to find the starting point. Starting point is proper demography, uh, democros de demoscopy, is that the word in English? Uh, you know your fan, know who, how to address them, how they're using, how they're consuming, what is on offer. Second thing, at least, if not before, fill the stadium. Um, we see that from time to time in this area, often that an empty stadia don't look good on TV. So first thing is possibly to enhance the event. How do you do that? And here comes in all the modern technology. Don't start with a TV signal. Don't start investing into ultra motion cameras, and spider cam or something like that. Start in creating a platform for them, attracting them by regular content, informative content, raising the interest, creating a community, interacting with them, and then you take it step by step. If you have a community, if you have contacts, if you have a, a proper fan base, you can go to sponsors and sell them. You can go to media companies and sell them. By that, gradually raising the revenues, gradually raising the quality at, at an ultimate stage, and lead to the situation that even table tennis on a worldwide basis can afford yeah. visit. Yeah. I think, um, you know, I think it's, uh, I think you also need the TV <coughs> to help enhance the, the event. Um, because, yes, it's still the stadium, but then not everybody's able to come to see it. I think you have to work on it together. Um, bring in the fans, make the event look good on TV so that you get more viewers watching you know, I, I always go back to the, to the Winter Olympics with the curling, where outside the Winter Olympics, I don't think anybody, not anybody, most people are not that interested in, in curling. But then the Winter Olympics come, and it's glued to the television, watching it, 
And this year, what they did, because they managed to show it in a different way, you're getting more viewers. And so with these technologies to make the sport more interesting at home, you also build a fan so that next time um, a competition comes to not part to where you live, you're going to go and watch a TV event because you already know. And part of it is or also um, helping, I don't want to say educating, but it's helping the viewer understand what's going on when he sits at home and watches TV so that he wants to see more. So I, I think they, you kind of have to work together on these two things. I don't see it as a step by step, but yes, make the event in, engaging, make the TV production engaging. And then together you're going to build the brand, and you know, that's going to Well, the curling, the graphics and the curling definitely helps you understand the sport much more than you used to. With the overhead cameras, I mean, you used to yeah. have those overhead yeah. cameras. You would, you would watch curling and not have any idea what's going on. So, for my side, I think um, um, I'm going to answer it slightly differently uh, because, uh, as you know, uh, you know, you can imagine me like I'm in Asia. I'm always. You know, moving content from one continent to another, so I'm seeing a trend of, I mean, Asia being a you know a big country and heterogeneous, very fragmented, right? Like you have uh, Thai language, Japanese, uh, Singapore, Malaysia. I think you know they 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 prefer different types of sports. So some of the sports like baseball is not very popular in where I come from, Singapore, Malaysia, right? So how do you bring those feet? to Asia in a competitive manner because all the guys who are interested would be Japan, Taiwan, Korea, just three countries. And it's, it could be it can be quite expensive to put it on double hop satellite to reach Asia. So it becomes uh, the cost of access to this content in terms of technology is, is higher. So uh, what we do is we uh, run it on fiber because uh, we have media pops all around the, all around the globe. And uh, this is not a sales pitch. I mean, this is what is happening, right? So um, we have access to this content in US and in, in Europe, where we, we, we push it all the way into the broadcaster's doorstep. So it becomes very easy for the uh, content, what do you call that, content purchasers to, to, to make a decision, because they do not need to pay additional huge amount of fees to make the sport available to their viewers. Likewise, we are also seeing a lot of uh, domestic when I say domestic, I mean Asian-based sports. Uh, they are being sent, sent to US and Europe um, for the second screen and for the team. So, so uh, from based on the perspective of a DHL guy, DHL man, right? Uh, we are seeing a lot of requests uh, to, to to deliver from one uh, one continent to another. So that is a, a very small way we can do to help these sports to make it available to the audience in another region, another territory, so that you can glorify it, you know. And it takes time to, to grow. So so from, from a delivery perspective, this is something that we can, we can do. We are doing to, to popularize this content. Um, <coughs> if I may add to, to what my colleagues have just said, I think that uh, <coughs> um, there's a, a kind of a problem, let's, let's put it this way, an issue. Uh, the, the, the actual sports industry in Asia is, is much smaller than in other parts of the world. So it's difficult to sustain uh, certain kind of cost uh, without sponsors, without brand exposure. The AFC Champions League is one tenth of the UEFA Champions League in terms of value. Uh, same thing can, uh, happens to, to similar properties, more or less. I think that the, it's the market that is growing. I think that uh, thanks to less expensive technology in terms of the leader, being able to maybe templatize a certain kind of uh, actions or a certain kind of uh, investments that we are making, being able also to carry over certain standards that HBS is able to put in place, it will be easier to achieve certain change, but it will be it's still be difficult uh, unless the overall industry becomes richer, right? Uh, and now, to, not to tell my, my, my own ho horn, uh, I think that uh, if uh, entities, other rights owners, other federations, other, um, other uh, um, sports owners are looking at uh, expanding their ability to reach an audience through uh, non-conventional broadcasting technologies, I think that uh, it will achieve this change faster. 
because uh, not necessarily you need to go through a broadcaster to achieve your audience. Now, whether this audience is a niche or a mass audience, it's, it's still uh, to be seen. But definitely in the next year, in the, in the years to come, the, the overall industry will become richer, the, the, the cost of delivery will become uh, uh, cheaper, and hopefully you will have more means to access this content that, that right now is not available, no matter what. Any questions? Anybody? We'll wrap up. We've gone over. <laughs> but I appreciate everybody for sticking around and joining us, and we'll be around for the next 10 minutes or so, so please join us to chat. Thank you very much. <laughs> you will be able to control the smart TV app with your remote control or you will be able to launch your smart TV app using the multi-screen feature embedded in the mobile app. So you have this and you say you want to watch so you are using your remote this is one camera to use it. The second thing is we have a and then you are like, I watch the video, but I just found out the channel is small. So, now I'm going to watch the video. 